Jesus loves me, yes I know, the Bible tells me so. Little ones to weak me comes, they are weak but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus was a little man, wee little man, he climbed up in the living tree and to see. The way he went up in the tree, he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. Oh, house today, we're coming to your house today. I guess it's my turn. Curtis says it's my turn. All right. Welcome to Mount Carmel Baptist Church. I forgot what I was doing for a second there. Let me remind you of what we're supposed to be doing here today. Uh, we may not get it all exactly right, sometimes a little imperfect, but we are here to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. That's why we gather here. And we're going to try to do that today. And we do that a lot of ways. We have preaching, singing, praying, taking up an offering. We have an invitation. There are a lot of different parts to our service, but ultimately we want all those things to point you to Jesus and to lift up His name. That's why we're here. So thank you for being here with us today. A lot of things you could have done today, and you've chosen to be with, here, be with us here and worship Jesus. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate you being here. And hopefully today, as we lift up the name of Jesus, it lifts you up as well. And that's, uh, that's I hope the result of us having a worship service and lifting up Jesus today is it lifts you up too. But thank you for choosing to be with us. If this is your first time or maybe your first time in a real long time, in the pew in front of you, there should be a welcome card there. If you would, take some time during our service, fill that card out, and then you can do a couple of different things. You can drop it in the offering plate when we pass those later, or if you would, uh, just take it to our welcome center. And that's the easiest way to do that is on your way out, drop it by the Welcome Center, and they'll give you a gift for visiting with us today. And then we'll send you some information about our church, just telling you just a little bit more about who we are and what we do here at Mount Carmel. But whether this is your first time or your thousand and first time, we're glad to have you with us. I hope that you'll have a good time in the Lord as we worship Him together today. One of the things we do is each week we have a Deacon of the Week, and that Deacon comes I have a scripture verse here, and uh, there's, there, this deacon is going to lead some prayer, read scripture, and share whatever's on his heart. The deacon of the week this week is Greg Best. So, Greg, if you would come at this time. I'd like to once again welcome everybody out this morning. Uh, the scripture this morning I'm going to be reading from will be Galatians 5.13. For brethren, you have been called into liberty... I only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but to love and service for one another. As I thought about that scripture a little bit, uh, I kind of did a little bit of looking around and just thinking, you know, with liberty, what do you think of liberty as in freedom in Christ? Uh, Christian liberty is granted by the Savior, uh, governed by the scripture, which is something we need to be bedded in quite often, and uh, uh, is guided by the Spirit. But freedom only comes through Jesus Christ. So I'd like to follow that up today to say, uh, if you don't know who this Jesus is I'm talking about, I hope you come to know him today before you leave this building. Uh, if, you, if you need to come up uh, when, when time comes or whenever it is and you feel convicted, come forward. Get your life in line with Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the day. I thank you for the blessings of life. I, I just thank you for the good Sunday school class we had this morning, God. And uh, just help us always to be humble, God, and uh, show love to one another. 
lift you up in all that we say and do, God, and put self aside, God. Help us to do that. If we could ever do that, God, uh, we could stay on track with you, God, and just uh, follow your will and not ourself, God. God, I pray for lost souls in here this morning, God, uh, or backslidden, God. I pray that they come forward and get their life in line with you, God, before it's eternally too late. Uh, I just want to tell you that I love and praise you and just ask you to be with Scott as he brings the message. Uh, give him the words we need to hear. Help us to be receptive and apply it to our life. I just want to tell you that I love and praise you and thank you for Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Before we get into our worship service, any birthdays and anniversaries? If we'll all stand and turn in our church hymnal to page 188, 188.
page 228, 228. We'll sing all five verses.
Hold on a second. A little unorganized, but it's okay. Uh, we uh, just got back from our winter retreat with our youth. Had a great time. They, uh, they got to listen to the Word of God. Uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas and Peyton come up, and uh, they led our ser- uh, services, sermons, and uh, they did a great job. Uh, continue to pray for Thomas and Peyton as they uh, follow the Lord's will in their life. Uh, amazing job. Uh, just I can't say it enough. Thomas really did good. Dug into the Word, and uh, uh, the, the the service uh, the whole weekend was set on uh, grounded in faith. And uh, we had a good group of kids. Give our hand for our kids. And uh, if you ever if you get a chance to be part of a kid's life, I'm telling you, when they're not yours, they're better. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, y'all. Seriously, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but there's such love, man, and you grow from that kind of stuff. And and is and I'm like one of the old guys up there this weekend, and I still learn and got closer to the Lord because I was in there. And and I, I, you deal with the same things. It may be at a different level, but you still deal with the same things. And they're such a blessing. And I love them all, and they did good, and they sang their hearts out up there. And if y'all would have been able to hear it, maybe there's some videos, I don't know, but they they love the Lord, and you could tell it. They were singing, and uh, so we're going to go over, uh, do a song that kind of tied in with uh, being grounded in faith, and uh, you're going to love it. Just pray for them, pray for our youth. Always remember to lift them up in prayers.
Hey, stand up here. We got to we got to move them out of the uh, choir loft. They've been had a very busy weekend, and I don't want it on video them sleeping through my sermon today. So we're gonna have to move them out. I told them I'd, I'd yell a lot and jump around some. Maybe I can keep them awake. They've had a, a good weekend, a fun weekend. I appreciate them leading us in worship today. This time we're going to stop our sermon and we're going to receive an offering for the morning. So if our ushers would come and after we receive our offering, then I'll come preach. I'm going to be in Acts chapter 15 verse 1 if you want to turn there. And uh, while you turn it in your Bibles and doing two, three, two or three things at once, do this if you would. Pray, ask God what He would have you to give, and be obedient to the Lord in giving. So you all know this already, I hope, but giving is a way that we worship God. One of the ways, singing, preaching, praying, taking up an offering, but one of the ways we worship God is through giving. God doesn't need it, but He wants us to be surrendered to Him, all of us. And that includes the finances that we have available to us that God gives us. So this morning you pray, ask God what he'd have you to give. You be obedient as the Lord leads you this morning, all right? Brother David, would you lead us in prayer as we go to the Lord? Heavenly Father, thank you once again for allowing us to come back to your house. And thank you, God, for the, uh, the sweet spirit we've already felt here today. Thank you for our youth, our youth leaders, and what they're doing, God. Just bless them. God, just take this offering and use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom. And help us, God, give in accordance to your will. Use us, God. Lead us and guide us. Forgive us where we fail you. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Listen to this first verse, and then we'll get to the chorus. If you know that chorus, sing it with me, will you? There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see.
Thank you, Mount Carmel Hillbilly Orchestra. Appreciate you all leading us the way you do. Thank you. Acts chapter 15 is where we're going to be this morning. We're going to begin a series, and it'll uh, go for a few weeks, but we're going to begin a series this morning called uh, temp- Dealing with Temptation. What well, I'm called Triumph Over Temptation. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to try to look at our own lives, and we're going to try to look at the Word of God, and we're, we're going to try to conform our lives to God's Word, and we're going to try to deal with temptation in our lives. How do you and I as believers handle that and resist temptation? Now, what we're going to find this morning is that there are dual dangers when we first begin to try to triumph over temptation. Dual dangers. We're laying a, a foundation here. We're laying the groundwork. Before we can ever get into the, the uh, arguments of how the Bible tells us to deal with real temptation in our lives, there are some things that we must know, some foundational truths that make all the difference in the world when dealing with temptation. Acts chapter 15 verse 1 says this, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Would you all pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word and your spirit. Father, we thank you for being in this place with us today. Help us today to leave this place more like Jesus, less like the old person we used to be. If somebody here today is lost, I pray that today would be the day they come to know you as Lord and Savior of their life. Father, I pray that you would uh, just continue to do work in us that only you can do, that we would serve you faithfully in this life, and that we go to be with you in the life to come. Thank you for all the things you've done for us, but above all things, thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Harry Randall Truman was an 83-year-old man. He was the owner and caretaker of the Mount St. Helens Lodge at Spirit Lake. He had survived the sinking of his troop ship by a German submarine off the coast of Ireland during World War I. He had seen a lot of things in his life, Harry had. And he was not about to leave just because some scientist thought there was a danger. Truman told reporters this, he said, I don't have any idea whether it will blow or not. I don't believe it to the point that I'm going to pack it up. And then on May 18, 1980... Mount St. Helens erupted, and Truman and his lodge were buried beneath about 100 feet of mu- 150 feet of mud and debris from the volcanic eruption. His body was never found. You and I face some of these same dangers and say, see some of the same warning signs in our own lives. We are in danger of this volcanic spiritual eruption. Don't avoid the warning signs. So today we're going to start a series called Triumph Over Temptation, and we're going to look at the beginning of Acts here. Acts tells us how the church started and how it acted when it started. And we're going to see in the book of Acts some dangers to avoid that they learned to avoid. As the church started in the book of Acts, there were some dangers they had to avoid that we need to avoid as well. It starts with this, as we look at the book of Acts, and as we look at our own triumph over temptation, the first thing you and I need to know is that apart from Jesus Christ, you and I are lost. Acts 2.38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 4.12 says this, and there is salvation, this is Peter preaching again, he says this, There is salvation in no one else, for neither is there any under name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Paul says it this way in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now one of the foundational truths that you and I need to understand if we're going to deal with temptation is that apart from Jesus Christ, you and I are lost. That's lost. That's a word we use at church to describe being spiritually separated from Almighty God. Now, if you don't know this already, let me tell you, God is holy. He is untouched and undefiled by sin. 
God never sins. You and I do. I'm not sure if that's a shock to you to know that, that you sin. Now, I guess I need to take that a step further because we're going to talk about the Pharisees and some of the religious leaders of Jesus' day and the time of Peter and Paul, the Acts of the Apostles. And If you'd ask a Pharisee if they sinned, they might say yes. But if you ask a Pharisee, are you a sinner? And they would say no. Now, I don't want you to fall into that same trap and think, yeah, you know, I sin sometimes, but I'm not really a bad person. I mean, I'm a pretty good person. I, I try to... I try to help out my neighbor, try to love my family. I'm a good worker. I, I show up to work on time. I, I do my job, and I try to be nice to people, and I'm a pretty good person. As I have gone through life and shared my faith with people and talked about how to be saved, do you know how many times I have been given that answer whenever I ask, why should God let you into heaven? You know how many people think that the reason they're going to heaven is because they're pretty good people? Folks, you and I are sinners and we are separated from a holy God because of our sin. And you're not going to get to heaven because you're a pretty good person. You know, maybe you are a pretty good person. But that depends on the standard you're using, it doesn't it? That depends on your measuring stick a little bit. Compared to Herman Heron, maybe you're a saint. I don't know. I heard about a preacher one time, and a, and a scoundrel in the community died. He never went to church, didn't know the Lord, was just a, was a dirty, rotten fellow. I mean, he was just, he was, everybody knew how terrible a guy he was, and his family talked to the local preacher, and they asked him to do the funeral, and they said, listen, we'll pay you $500 to do this funeral. The only thing we ask is that you say something nice about him during the service. And he said, okay, I'll do it. And he got up at the funeral. And he said, well, old brother Randall died. He was as sorry a feller as there ever was. Nobody liked him. He didn't like anybody else. He stole. He cheated. He lied. He murdered. He was one of the meanest people I've ever known. He was a terrible person. But compared to Herman Heron, he was a saint. <laughs> so, you know, you, if you look around you and you compare, isn't it the way we do it, though? We look around us. And we compare ourselves to others. Now, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to... Mm, maybe I shouldn't say we. Maybe I should just say me. And I'm shooting down a hole. And if you happen to be down there, I'm sorry. That's your fault. I, I'll talk about myself here for a little bit, okay? When I look around and compare myself to others, here's two things I do. Number one, I usually compare my best traits to their worst traits. Isn't that the way that goes? And number two... I usually find a much worse person than me to compare myself to. And if you look around close enough, you can find other people that are worse than you. And if you are real careful about your traits and selecting theirs, you can usually find something that you're better at than other people. If you compare yourselves to those around you, maybe you're a pretty good person. But when you compare yourself to a holy God, you and I fall far, far short. God never sins. You and I are lost. We are separated from God because of our sin. Now, as we begin to deal with our sin, remember, we're starting a series on triumphing over temptation. Well, we have to start somewhere. If we're going to deal with our sinfulness and we're going to deal with sin in our lives, we have to start somewhere. And there are two dangers, these dual dangers as we begin to deal with our own sinfulness and our own lostness. Number one, there's legalism. That's what we read in Acts 15 verse 1. Verse 1 of that chapter says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Legalism. Here's what Romans 2.23 says, You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. They, so what had happened here is this. There were some Jewish men, some Pharisees, who had come down from Judea, and they were teaching the brothers, unless you uh, follow the customs of Moses, and unless you're circumcised, you cannot be saved. You have to do this, 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 and this if you want to go to heaven, if you want to be saved. Now, this is an example of those who would seek to be saved by their own good works. Let me 
translate that into East Tennessee here for you. That would be the kind of person who says, well, I believe I'm a pretty good person. I believe I'm, uh, I'm a good husband. I'm a good wife, whichever one you are. I, I'm a good son or daughter. I'm a good mother. I'm a good father, good grandparent. I, I'm a hard worker. I, I try to treat people kind, try to do for others. I, I'm a nice person. Uh, why, the other day in traffic, I even stopped and let somebody pull out in front of me and didn't even blow the horn at them when they did so. I'm a really good person. That kind of language is the same language used in Acts 15.1. The idea that if you follow a certain set of rules, that that's going to get you to heaven. You know, preachers have been in danger of legalism over the years. They preach against everything under the sun. They preach against going to the movies, preach against going to TV, preach against HBO, Hell's Box Office. When I was a kid, that's, I heard a lot of preachers talk about HBO, Hell's Box Office. You're not supposed to go to ball games. The preachers used to preach on what kind of eyeglasses you were going to wear. And if you think I'm making this up or exaggerating, you can go back and listen to some old, old sermons. Preachers used to preach against wearing horn-rimmed glasses because that was worldly. And imagine thinking that the kind of glasses you wear make you more like Jesus or less like Jesus. We don't even know that Jesus wore glasses. <laughs> I, the Bible doesn't mention him having to wear glasses. I, 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 don't, I don't think he did. My suspicion is if he could walk on water and if he could heal the blind, he probably didn't need glasses anyway. That's just my suspicion. But even preachers can be guilty of, of legalism at times where we add to the Word of God, we try to change it. Or... Now let me tell you a story from the book of Acts. Peter is on a rooftop praying. Y'all ever heard of Peter? He was one of Jesus' disciples. Later they called them apostles. Apostle means sent one. So after Jesus rises from the dead and ascends to the right hand of the Father, he sends out his disciples, and now they're called apostles. Peter was the leader of the apostles. He's on a rooftop praying, and he has a vision. Three different times this vision occurred to him. A large sheet lowered down from heaven, and in this sheet were all kinds of animals, what they would call clean and unclean animals. Now there's a whole set of rules in the Old Testament about which animals were clean and which were unclean, and if you were going to eat an animal, how you needed to clean it, particularly if you were going to eat the animal and what parts of the animal you could eat. Y'all uh, y'all heard of Hebrew National Hot Dogs? Nod your head if you, if you know what I'm talking about. All right, does anybody know the commercial? The, the, what's the motto on the commercial? Anybody know it? No ifs, ands, or buts. B-U-T-T. -T. Didn't you say that at church? B -U -T -T. Buts, no buts. Uh, that means that there are particular parts of the cow that Jewish people are allowed to eat and particular parts of a cow they are not allowed to eat. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give you a spoiler here. Eating the shoulder of a cow doesn't make you righteous, and eating the, a rump roast doesn't make you sinful. There's nothing sinful about a rump roast. That was not the point. It never was the point. Peter has this vision. And all these animals come down and, and God speaks to him and says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, I've never eaten anything unclean. And the Lord answers him and says this, What I have called clean, don't you call unclean. And it happens again, and it happens again. And three times it happens, this vision of these clean and unclean animals, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, if you're thinking that Peter could have picked the clean animals and eaten that and avoided the unclean animals, but here's the deal. According to their thoughts in those days, if an unclean animal touched a clean animal, it made the clean animal now unclean. And so, in other words, it wasn't just sinful to eat a rump roast. If there was a rump roast laying there and a shoulder of a cow laying there, but the rump roast accidentally touched the shoulder of the cow, and you ate that, you were sinful. You were immoral. If a rump roast touched a shoulder roast, and then you ate it, you were sinful. That was never the point. God never intended them to understand it that way. Let me read you those verses. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 24 through 26. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, 
And I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean and the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by beast or by bird or by anything unclean. You shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Now there's that verse, separating clean animals from the unclean. And on the, either side of that verse, he talks about going into a place where people do not worship him and do not believe in him. And he is saying, don't be like them. Here are these people who do not believe in God, who do not worship God, and who do not serve God. And God has set up some visible reminders by the things they eat and the clothes that they wear and different rules to follow just to remind them, you worship me. That was the point of these rules. You're supposed to be reminded and remember that you are supposed to worship the Lord God and Him alone. That was the whole point of this. That was the purpose. God is holy. You remember me starting off that way and telling you that God's holy and we're not? You see, the rules that they used for eating meat and that sort of thing was a visible reminder of what you and I need to be reminded of today. God is holy and we're not. The people around us may lead us astray, but God never will. We need to turn to Him. He is our only hope. These verses, this story, that, this vision that Peter had, this, this wasn't a vision about shrimp and lamb it really wasn't about boiled shrimp and leg of lamb that was not the point that they were supposed to to get out of this they were supposed to stay away from the other gods of the other nations those people who worshiped Baal and who would lead them astray into worshiping false gods the visible reminder of a spiritual truth God's holy He's perfect, you're not. Now let me tell you what God did to remedy that. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who left the splendor and the glory of heaven where He was worshipped, served, and adored, and Jesus came to this earth. He was born a special, unique birth, a virgin birth. He lived a special, unique life, a sinless life. And then He died on the cross, a special, unique death. He died in your place and in my place. He died for your sins and for my sins. And on the third day, He rose from the dead. He is victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. One day, He is coming back to receive all those who believe in Him unto Himself. You're not perfect. God is. But I'm going to tell you what God did. God sent His Son, the perfect sacrifice, to die in your place and in my place, to pay for your sins and for my sins. That's what God did for you and me. Now, when we're dealing with temptation and we're trying, to, we're trying to get our lives straight with God, one of the dangers is turning to legalism, thinking that you have to clean yourself up and then come to God. Friend, it is exactly the opposite of that. You don't clean yourself up and come to God. You come to God and He cleans you up. It is exactly the opposite of the way most people think. We don't come to God and tell Him how good we are. We come to God and tell Him how sinful we are, and we admit, I need Jesus. Legalism doesn't do that. Legalism says if you follow these rules and these rituals and these regulations, then you're going to be more righteous than the people around you. Legalism sees it kind of this way. On one side of the scales is our sin, and on the other side of the scales is our good works. And as long as our good works are more than our sin, the good works outweigh the sinfulness, and we just tip the scales and get into heaven. Friend, you cannot outdo sin. Your goodness does not pay for your sinfulness. That's not how it works. Sin must be paid for. And it requires a blood sacrifice. You can pay for your sins with your eternity, or you can let Jesus pay for them. Legalism says, I'm going to take care of it on my own. I don't need God. I certainly don't need Jesus Christ. You know, the fact is, Peter had this vision. All these unclean and clean animals. And he said, I've never eaten anything unclean. And God showed him this vision and said, what I've called clean, don't you call unclean. And at that same time, there's a knock on the door of the house where he is staying and praying. And, and somebody says, uh, hey, our, our master Cornelius sent us. 
and God spoke to him in a vision, and an angel said to come here and ask for Peter, and that Peter would tell my master how to be saved. Peter got the message. Here's a Gentile, and Peter is a Jew. Remember, those, if those meats touched, that made them all, both unclean. Well, they also thought if Jews and Gentiles came into contact, that made them both unclean. Somehow or another, if Peter, being a Jew, hung out with a Gentile, all of a sudden it would make him sinful. And he, he heard that voice from heaven. He understood the vision. We're not talking about shrimp and leg of lamb. We're talking about people. And God loves people. And he wants people to be saved. And so he sent Peter. Peter preached to Cornelius. Cornelius and all his house received Jesus Christ and got saved. Friend, if you want to go to heaven, you don't do so by being a Jew or be, by being a Gentile. You don't go to heaven by being a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian. You're sure not going to get there by being a Rio kind of guy. I can tell you that for sure. You're not going to get to heaven by any denomination. You're not going to get to heaven because you were baptized or because you were on a church roll. You're not going to get to heaven because you're a preacher or because you're a deacon or a Sunday school teacher. You're sure not going to get to heaven because mama or granddaddy was a teacher or as a preacher or a deacon or something like that. God doesn't have any grandchildren. If you want to go to heaven, you have to be a child of God. And the only way that happens is by giving your sinfulness over to Jesus Christ and receiving His righteousness. Legalism. That's one of the dangers. Paul says it this way, when we try to add to Scripture and work our way to heaven, Romans 3.28 says this, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. If you're going to go to heaven, it can't be by legalism. You're not going to work your way there or be good enough. You're certainly not going to add to the, what God has said. God says you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. And boy, we need grace. We need grace. Legalism. But then there's also this second danger, not just the danger of legalism, there's the danger of liberalism. Now, when I say this, I need to make sure we're all on the same page. I'm not talking about politics here, although if you've been around me for any length of time, you've probably figured out I'm pretty conservative in most of my views in life, but I'm not talking about Democrat or Republican, I'm not being talking about political views, liberalism or conservatism. I'm, I'm talking about biblical and theological views here, liberalism. Legalism adds to the Word of God and says, here are the rules that I want to add to God's rules, and you've got to follow these rules, my rules, in order to get to heaven. That's legalism. Liberalism takes away from the Word of God and says, there are no rules. This is licentiousness is a word the Bible uses to describe this. No rules, you can do whatever you want to. There are no rules. They, another, there was another name in church history that applied to these kinds of people. They were called antinomians. That means no law. Anti meaning against or without and, and uh, nomian meaning law. Antinomian, no law. There have been people throughout the history of the world who believe that you can just live any old way you want to and it doesn't affect you spiritually. In the New Testament, we read the Bible address this several times. John, specifically in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, there were, there were people called Gnostics who said that the Spirit doesn't affect the flesh, the flesh doesn't affect the Spirit. You can get saved and do whatever you want to, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't hurt you spiritually. Listen to me, friend. Sin hurts. Sin hurts. People even accuse Paul of doing this very thing. The gospel went out to the Gentiles. And they didn't follow the same rituals and rules as the Jews. And Pete, the church wrestled with that, struggled with that. Are, are they still saved? And are they still righteous even though they, don't, they, they can eat shrimp and we can't? Are they still righteous? And they finally had to come to the conclusion that shrimp is not what made you righteous. Jesus makes you righteous. But they should have known that. They should already have figured that out. Jesus dealt with that in Mark chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. Here's what Jesus said. He said unto them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not into his heart, since it enters not his heart, but into his stomach, and is expelled? And then Mark adds this, this at the end. Mark says, Thus he declared all foods clean. Jesus says, it's not what you eat, 
that makes you holy. It's not what goes into you that makes you holy. It's what comes out. So we have to let God work from the inside out. Legalism adds rules to that and adds rules to the Word of God. Liberalism says there are no rules. Well, friend, there are rules. Here's what happened in Acts. Verse 21, excuse me, chapter 21, verse 26. Paul took men the next day. He purified himself along with them, went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Here's what happened. Those legalists, the Pharisees that we were talking about earlier, who added all these rules to being saved, They came along and said, no, no, Paul is teaching that you don't have to follow any rules. There are no rules. Paul is telling everybody you, there are no rules. You can live any old way you want to, and you're still going to go to heaven. You ever ever known people that believe that? That you could just live any old way you want to, and you're still going to go to heaven? I've known plenty. I bet you have too. Matter of fact, Dad says this. He says that preachers have done as much to hurt Christianity as anything because at somebody's funeral, they stand up and preach them into heaven. It doesn't matter who they were or what they did or how sorry they were. They get up and talk like they's in heaven. We know that. You know, friend, I'm going to tell you, I try real hard not to do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, I can't see people's hearts. I don't know who's saved and who's lost. Number two, God doesn't give me the responsibility to decide who goes to heaven and who doesn't. God just gives me the responsibility to tell how you get there. And I know how you get there. You get there through Jesus Christ. But who goes and who doesn't, I don't know, though. God determines who goes and who doesn't. I don't get to determine that. Well, they had, they had accused Paul of this very thing of saying, you can just uh, live any old way you want to. It doesn't affect you spiritually. So we're trying to triumph over temptation, right? That's what we're looking at over the next few weeks. And you can add unbiblical rules to that and become a legalist, add extra steps to salvation. That's part of it. But you can also do this. You can fall off on the other side of the road, these dual dangers. One side is legalism, the other side is liberalism. There's adding to the rules on this side. Then there's thinking there are no rules on the other side. People that think you can pray a prayer and get saved and then that's it. And any, any way you live after that doesn't matter, doesn't affect you, do, it, then and you're going to go to heaven, friend, listen to me. There was no grace under the law, but I'm going to tell you something, there's always law when it comes to grace. There are always rules. So, let's go back to shrimp. Everybody's going to be hungry by the time we finish this sermon. Because I've mentioned shrimp and leg of lamb now and rump roast. And uh, everybody's going to be real hungry by the time we finish. Let's go back to shrimp. Shrimp versus leg of lamb. And they had this idea that because God said some animals are clean and some are unclean, that somehow eating shrimp made you sinful, but eating leg of lamb made you holy. That was never the point that God was trying to make. They missed the point entirely. Shrimp doesn't make you sinful. Leg of lamb doesn't make you righteous. But there was a spiritual lesson that they were supposed to learn. They were supposed to learn that people are sinful and God is not. And we want to separate from sinful people. We want to follow God and His righteousness. We need to trust in the righteousness of God. Not our own righteousness, not the righteousness of those around us, not the rules of of those around us. There are those who believe you can get saved and live any old way you want to. That is not biblical salvation. Here's what Paul says about it in Romans. Romans 6 verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? There's the danger of legalism. And there's the danger of liberalism. Having too many rules that God doesn't give us or having no rules and saying you can sin all you want to and it doesn't affect you spiritually. 
Well, we're going to deal with temptation in our own sinfulness and our own lostness. We can't fall into the danger of legalism. We can't fall into the danger of, of liberalism. But here's, here's the biblical way. Greg mentioned it this morning when we started our service. Not legalism, not liberalism, but liberty. Freedom. This is the third option, and it's the option that you and I should choose. Not legalism, adding to the rules. Not liberalism, taking away from the rules. But liberty. Now free to live in and for Jesus. Acts 15, verses 10 and 11. Here's the words of Peter in Acts 15. Now therefore, why tempt ye God? to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Peter says this, anybody who's ever been saved, if they're going to be saved, they're going to be saved because of Jesus Christ and His shed blood and His righteousness. And that's it. We end this where we started. We're in the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 15. After he'd seen this vision of clean and unclean, he finally figured it out. It's not about shrimp, rump roast, and leg of lamb. It's about our own sinfulness and the righteousness that only comes from Jesus. Greg read this first to start off with, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Here's the Christian walk. You ready? Christian walk. Here's salvation. There's three parts to it. Y'all should write this down. This is good theology here. Y'all write this down. Salvation. There's three parts to it. Number one, there's justification. Number two, there's sanctification. Number three, there's glorification. That's the three parts of salvation. Justification happens when you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, what we call being saved. That's the first step in salvation. You believe that Jesus is righteous and you are sinful, and you believe He paid the price for your sin. You ask Him to forgive you of your sins and be the Lord of your life, what we call at church being saved. The second you do that, the penalty for sin has been paid by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. In the eyes of God, you are not guilty of your sin anymore. The punishment has been paid. You don't owe anybody anything because of your sinfulness. Jesus paid it all. And now that gives you the freedom to start that second part, sanctification. You see, when you get saved, all of your sins are forgiven. Now, when I was a kid... I was taught that this is a bad disbelief, that once you get saved, you're always saved. You cannot lose your salvation. I was taught that as a kid, as I've read the Bible and studied God's Word and walked with Christ, I still believe that to this day. I believe it more so than I did when I was a kid and somebody else told it to me. I've now had the chance to live it and to study it and to learn it. Once you get saved, you're saved for all eternity. But you've heard me say this a lot, getting saved is not the end, it's just the beginning. When I was a kid, we would talk about eternal security, but then Dad would say, if you're, if you're a Christian and you've sinned, you need to come and pray and confess that to God and get it right. And so I had to struggle with that. Why, why do you pray and confess your sins if all of your sins have already been forgiven? Well, what I didn't understand then that I do understand now is when you get saved, that pays for the penalty of your sin. But now that you're a believer, you have to pay, pray over the power of sin. Now you have to begin that process of sanctification. It is now not just the penalty of sin. That's been paid for by Jesus Christ, but now we're talking about about the power of sin. Now that you're saved, you want to live like Jesus and not like the old self. You want to become more like Jesus Christ, and that takes humbling yourself, submitting yourself to Jesus, and walking with Him. That's what we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks. That's a lifelong, lifetime process where you become more like Jesus and less like the old person you used to be. And then at some point, there's going to be glorification where you receive a new glorified body, rises from the grave, 
your spirit, soul, and body are reunited for all eternity. There is no more death or sorrow. There's a new heaven and new earth. That's the ultimate. That's the final part of that story. That's the end of the story is glorification. We see Jesus Christ. He comes back. He receives us unto himself. We have a new body that never gets old, never gets sick, never gets tired. All of sin will be undone. It's not yet. All of sin is not erased. If you're a believer, you still struggle with sin. And there are dangers to avoid. The danger of legalism and the danger of liberalism. God calls us to liberty. It starts with Jesus. It ends with Him too. What Hebrews chapter 12 says is that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Have you started that walk with Him today? Have you ever been saved and asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and be the Lord of your life? You can do that right here, right now, today. I'm going to pray a prayer out loud. If you're here and you have never been saved, you can pray this prayer silently. This prayer doesn't save you. Jesus does. But if you're sincere in this prayer, Jesus will save you right here, right now, today. The prayer goes like this. Jesus, I know I have sinned. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to save me. I turn from my sins and I turn to you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now help me to live for you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, will you come talk to me? As I said, getting saved is not the end. It's just the beginning. And I want to talk to you about how to walk with and for Jesus for the rest of your life. Maybe you're here and you have been saved, but there is some sin in your life and you do need to come and confess it. Walk with Jesus more closely. Get that sin out of your life. Get more of Jesus in. Continue on that road to sanctification, becoming more like Jesus. Maybe some other decision. Maybe you want to join our church. Maybe you have been saved, but you haven't followed the Lord in baptism and you want to do that. Make that public profession of your salvation through baptism or maybe some other decision maybe you just need to leave a burden here at this altar praying with the lord and you need to make that this morning and maybe some other decision listen whatever decision you need to make if god is speaking to your heart you step out and come would you stand with me our instrumentalists are going to play a hymn of invitation i'll be standing down here at the front if god is speaking to your heart if there's a decision you need to make you step out right now and come